that the reason we had the American channels was because they were also available and you had to have them. The government's fears about cable television's American influence didn't end with programming. Most of the country's larger cable systems were partly owned by American companies. Of the 14 systems Metcalf controlled, six were built in partnership with famous players Canadian Corporation. 51% of that company was owned by a Hollywood studio. The deal that I had with famous players was that I would uh, get a, uh, an authority to build a system and the kind of authority that you needed in those days was really an agreement with the telephone company or the hydro in the particular town. Uh, I would get the agreement and then I would go to them and we would go forward on a 50-50 basis. They put up the money and I would uh, run the system and, uh, and make it work. I have no hesitation in saying that the position of this government is perfectly clear that we intend to do everything we can to see that broadcasting remains substantially Canadian. You can't fault the regulators entirely. I think uh, Canada's in a rather unique position in that we have attempted very valiantly to maintain a Canadian broadcasting system in this country that is distinctly Canadian and is quite apart from United States television, which we're so close to and are, have, which has so much influence on us. On the last day of 1963, the federal government announced it would not approve any cable licenses for new systems that were predominantly foreign, either in ownership or programming. The license freeze would last for more than seven months. It was the start of an intense lobbying campaign for the cable industry, a campaign that was misunderstood by many politicians. In fact, it was so bad that Mitchell Sharp, who was a senior member of the cabinet, it was a Pearson cabinet, I believe, at that time, but see, he could not get through his mind how cable would work. And I remember Mitchell Sharp one day uh, uh, saying to, uh, to Fred Metcalf and Omer Girard and to me, uh, tell me, he said, I, I could never, never quite understand how you, you could get all of those stations coming down that that uh, cable there, and 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 then separating them all out in the in the TV set, uh, in the foggiest notion what was going on in in uh, in the in the black box, so to speak. So it became apparent that we should uh, uh, have some kind of an organization which was going to be able to speak with some authority to. Uh, uh, members of government. It was during this period that the National Community Antenna Television Association played its first major role. Formed in 1957, the NCATA would later be known as the Canadian Cable Television Association. The early goals of the NCATA were to get as many cable operators as possible in the Cable Association in order to present a united front to promote our industry at government levels and other related industries. The CCTA was formed in the very early days uh, by uh, people like Fred Metcalf, the earliest pioneers of the, of the day, uh, to, I think, address common concerns and problems of the industry at that time, to uh, deal with uh, uh, regulatory matters that were surfacing at that time, we needed to represent more than individual systems. We needed to be able to speak for all of the systems, and uh, so uh, that's how it started out. I, I wrote letters to all the operators that I knew of and uh, invited them to get together, and uh, we met in Montreal because there were more systems in Quebec than there were uh, in Ontario. And uh, we met in Montreal, and then we formed the association from there. Fred Metcalf had become the association's first president. He was now asked to serve two more terms. During 1963 and 64, he helped the cable industry forge a strong new identity. Fred served two consecutive terms because at the time the government was going to impose more regulation on the CATV. And Fred was fully aware of all the ramifications that meant to the industry. And we thought it was better 
to keep Fred at the direction of the association during these troubled times. To me, he seemed to be farsighted and an acknowledged leader in communication matters. So he must have seen the need for some kind of association in order to lead us into the field of video. Fred, as a matter of fact, uh, was a born leader and uh, entrepreneur. He, was, uh, di he seemed to be dynamic and pragmatic uh, and democratic and, above all, a gentleman. But it wasn't easy being gentle with the government. In 1969, the newly formed CRTC announced only communities that were receiving at least two Canadian stations would be granted licenses for new cable systems. We were arguing that it was straight censorship. Uh, if you had an antenna and you were close enough to them, you could get them. And uh, if they are broadcast, then we should be allowed to receive them. And there was no iron curtain at the border. And uh, if they came across the border, we should get them. And we weren't bringing them across the border. We were receiving them in Canada. There was a very substantial pressure from the public, both direct on the CRTC and through MPs, to get reception. The general public couldn't see why people in Toronto could have four U.S. stations and in Calgary they couldn't have any. We uh, arranged uh, to let our subscribers know of the problems and ask them to write. And they wrote. We, generated so much mail that the government backed away. Ultimately, the Canadian people were the ones who would shape the nation's television system. In little more than a decade, cable would grow from 100,000 subscribers to almost half of all Canadian homes. Cable had become the viewer's secret weapon in the war for better television. By the late 1960s, that war was being waged in color. Color television had been available since the 1950s, but unreliable reception and the high cost of color sets made it a poor improvement on black and white television. But by 1967, improved technology and a move to color programming in the States was pointing Canadian viewing habits into different directions. It was also moving the cable companies into the big cities. In the early days, uh, color signals were very, very susceptible to interference, and indeed, uh, I suppose, still are, certainly, in, in fringe areas. But our signal would be more consistent. So our penetration, uh, when color became available, uh, went away up. Cable had always had a market in small communities that were isolated from transmission towers. But now, it was feasible to wire large centers like Toronto. An increase in high-rise construction was already degrading the reception of existing black and white signals. Companies were already lining up to take advantage of the next cable boom. But while Metcalf had the partial support of famous players, he was worried about the political climate. If the government had been so tough on American programming, what would the future be for American ownership? It was time to find a new partner, a Canadian partner. He chose McLean Hunter, a publishing company that hadn't entered the broadcasting business until 1961. Forever we were spending the money as quickly as we could make it because we were building new systems and expanding uh, across uh, Ontario. But we weren't expanding quickly enough, in my view. And that's why I was looking for a major partner. He also could see the handwriting on the wall that, uh, that Canada was going to go move the cable industry to be more like the broadcasting industry as far as ownership was concerned and he looked for a Canadian partner. I went to see uh, Don Hunter and Don Campbell and uh, it didn't take them very long to decide that it was a business that they were interested in and uh, in fact it didn't take very long at all. I was absolutely amazed at the quickness with which we, uh, we made a deal. Other people can tell you about his technical and business contributions, but someone that worked in the trenches and worked his way up in the company, I can relate his people contributions. 
Under Fred's guidance, employees were allowed to experiment and grow in the cable industry. The cable television industry has expanded rapidly in both Canada and the United States to feed the ever-increasing appetite of North Americans for quality entertainment and information services. By the early 70s, cable television was growing faster in Canada than anywhere else in the world. With Metcalfe's help, McLean Hunter Cable TV expanded into London, Peterborough, and Hamilton. But it was also clear that room for new growth was limited within existing franchises, especially in the major Canadian cities. In 1975, Metcalfe reasoned that the next great opportunity for cable was south of the border. Cable television had never been popular in large American cities because the market was saturated by local television stations. At least, that's what every cable entrepreneur believed. But Metcalf was an exception. He persuaded McLean Hunter to purchase a New Jersey cable system that was precariously close to the huge transmission towers of Manhattan. It was indeed a risky venture in 1975. That's why there wasn't a lineup of people to, to get into it. Uh, it uh, fortunately, at the same time as we were turning on our system in New Jersey, home box office were starting up pay television. This wide variety of services has led to greater subscriber acceptance of both pay and basic services. All of a sudden, uh, you know, stationary satellites were available for broadcasting use. So it was a success, uh, not on the old terms that cable television was successful, but on the new terms, which was selling new product that was available across the country. McLean Hunter wasn't the only party interested in specialty channels. The Canadian government was concerned that the VCR and satellite dish boom would undermine the CRTC. By the early 80s, it had allowed the licensing of satellites and pay TV channels. Metcalf, now the president of McLean Hunter, took advantage of these new opportunities. Under his direction, the company saw its subscriber base increase more than eight times while income shot up sixfold. Metcalf honored the industry's fathers by helping to found the Pioneer Club for Cable Television Veterans. At the same time, he looked after Cable's future by expanding home shopping services, classified advertising, and community programming. Part of it was being done to enhance the saleability of the product. If it was on the cable, uh, once more people would uh, uh, want to view it because uh, they knew the people, they knew the participants. community channel has a has a great appeal to a lot of people uh, within the community and uh, and as such is a, is a, if you turn it around that's obviously a reason why people buy cable his area of expertise in the cable business is that he really was the cable business in Canada for a long time and uh, helped to develop it he knew it from the ground up he knew the regulatory side of it he knew the marketing side of it and he certainly grew to know the financing side of it, uh, certainly as McLean Hunter became bigger and bigger in the business. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to share in this 100th anniversary update on McLean Hunter, particularly as this is the 10th conference and I had the pleasure of addressing you as your president. Three years after Metcalf retired as president, McLean Hunter celebrated its 100th birthday. Fred Metcalf was already celebrating some anniversaries of his own. It had been 10 years since he had been appointed company president, 20 years since he joined McLean Hunter, and 35 years since he first hit on the idea of entering the cable television business. Community antenna television began in Canada One thing that occurs to me as I'm talking is that Daddy must be a very good judge of people in order to do this.